Welcome into Restaurant Idea Factory today. What's today? Friday, February 17th. We're going to get into it. This uh, feels like a heavy show today, guys. I don't know why. So we've got to make sure bring some levity today. Riff 008. Why don't restaurants change? Ruth Reichel's documentary at South by Southwest. New York restaurant workers unionize. I know that's big news for you up there in New York, Kyle. Let's see. What else are we potentially talking about? We got the restaurants that uh, inspired Panda Express, maybe Rocco de Spirito's out there talking about stuff. We got uh, incarcerated, formerly incarcerated workers out there. Sriracha billionaire. We got a lot of interesting stuff potentially to be able to talk about today. So we'll that was that about today. Yeah, right. Let's uh, this this random fact stuff has been super fun. I mean, the fact that <laughs> Corey made a clip of Sean talking about uh, the love of the opera and ballet, like that was just that, that felt good. That was like goofy and silly. I couldn't find the picture. I'm gonna find it of me in the glasses and the pur purple uh, Lakers sweatshirt. Did you find the Snoopy picture? I didn't, but I can. All right, we got we got to find those pictures. You do your homework, bro. Sean already showed, Sean already just grabbed off the wall the picture of him when he's like 13 yeah, years old. So Kyle, exactly. we got we got to really step it up. So he's uh, uh Kyle, the what's, a, what's a random fact about Kyle and Sarah? Uh, I got kicked out of college for a, a semester. There's but, a random fact. Just a semester. Just a semester, and I and I successfully negotiated. That I didn't have to go home. That I spent that semester at school. So, so this like is your first ever. deal. You brokered your first deal. I broke my first deal. I was like, Dad, look, you don't want me home. Let's be honest here. Let me just stay here. I'll work. And I worked at Foot Locker, mm. and basically just partied for a whole semester. You didn't want to go back to Long Island, huh? I did not. <laughs> at the time, I didn't. I would love to go back now, but what, yeah, not at the time. What's that? What college were you at? Franklin and Marshall. Where's that? It's, like, it's in um, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Amish Ooh. country, dude. Yeah. Yeah, I was about to say that's Just all I know. Hour north, like an hour northwest of Philly. Okay, so you didn't go that far. Not that far. No, I, I, in hindsight, I would have gone farther and warmer. Good. Heard. I got booted. All right, Sean, you set the bar really high last week. <laughs> what? <laughs> what is random fact of Sean Walsh for this week? Well, I, it's not very random if you know me, but uh, this part of the fandom most people don't know, and that's in 2017, I was inducted to the Pro Football Ultimate Fan Association. So I went to Canton, Ohio, um, which is where I believe the organization has about 700 super fans across all 32 teams. It's a nonprofit uh, charity of all the teams, of all the fans that actually give back. So all of the crazy fans from every NFL team that you see typically on TV, whether it's Eagles fans, like, like fans, J E T S, Jets, 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 that dude? Yes, yes. All the crazy <laughs> fanatics. I am part of that organization. I was jumped into the gang. Um, 2017, I was in the parade uh, the same year that Ladanian Tomlinson got inducted into the Hall Ooh. of Fame. We were actually our fan float in front of 200,000 people. Uh, we were right in front of LT and Lorenzo Neal. Um, so that was my my fandom into uh, Charger fans. So when you when you think of super fans of any uh, of any NFL, actually any sports thing, I've been jumped into one of the greatest charity gangs there is and that's a pro football ultimate fan association can i just say something that <laughs> say the fact that lt is referred to anybody but number 56 <laughs> on the new york giants is fucking insane you did you have lt on your fantasy football team because if you <laughs> did, did you'd LT. call him whatever you want to call him those, year, <laughs> those years that he was putting up those stats you, you know, know what i think I, I yeah he was like 48 points a game yeah i, would, yeah, yeah, I called exactly. him uh, cash in the bank back exactly then. Is, is a beast man yeah. i, I I was I was remembering him because uh, you know he went to TCU obviously TCU in the championship game so he's on the sideline a bunch and that will bring him back <laughs> bring him back memories for sure. LT is Lawrence Taylor the greatest defensive player of all time for sure. All right, so mine I was inspired by a, a call I got a couple of days ago from Markus Franz Becker, my best friend since I was four years old. When I was two until seven, I lived in Germany. So I spoke in Deutsch and wow. it like totally changed my perspective on like the entire, like my whole life has, has really been such a, a unique perspective because I got to move around a lot. Like I wasn't one of those kids who grew up in the same neighborhood in Long Island my entire life and had the same homies <laughs> in my entire life. 
So it's, it's interesting. I'm, I'm really good at making acquaintances, not as good at making lifelong friends because I've moved around so much. But uh, Markus Fonsbeck is one of those people. So I got to I got to talk to him. He's decked out in Denver Broncos gear, top to bottom. He came visit us in Denver and is enamored with American culture because he had the American friend growing up, learned how to speak English from MTV. <laughs> so, so, so he's straight gangster. Uh, he's like, I don't know, 6'4", 320 pound, big, Shit. big German dude. <laughs> so anyway, random fact, shout out to Markus Fonsbecker and, and my family got cousins out there in Germany as well. So uh, I think cool. about that. I think about that a lot. That was super cool to be able to have a friend for how many how many years is that? Thirty six years. It's a long time. That it's a long. It's a long. Thirty eight. You're thirty eight. Long time. Uh, to four. I was four when I met him. Thirty six. Four. Forty. Forty. You're forty. Yeah. Nineteen eighty two. Yeah, you and I were both born. That's in right. That's what I thought. I was so like, all of a sudden, you. How did you lose years? Did I do that <laughs> math wrong? Yeah. yeah you six did. years. I was four years old. That's forty. I thought you were two. Okay. So four, I'm gonna yeah, talk yeah. about my Japanese heritage random fact next week. Okay. Cliffhanger. And so I'm good at math, Sean. Okay. Good. <laughs> um, that's all I'm checking. Uh. All right. I love that. Those are those are great little random facts. Let's uh let's officially kick off this show. Kick it to death. Do you love and hate the hospitality industry? Then you are in the right spot. Join your hosts, Kyle and Sarah, Sean Walshef, and Jensen Cummings as they talk shop and give real insights into the latest restaurant news and most pressing issues facing hospitality professionals today. Welcome in to the Restaurant Idea Factory. All right, Game Face, we got some headlines to read here, fellas. Rocco De Spirito names the biggest mistake chains are making with New York style pizza. The 50 year old Pasadena restaurant that inspired Panda Express gets a sleek new design. Did not know that Panda Express was stolen from an actual restaurant. That always makes me think of Taco Bell. Cafe Mita, I've been there where Taco Bell stole their idea from. It still exists today. Uh, how one of Philly's best pizza spots creates jobs for the formerly incarcerated. How Vietnamese refugee David Tran became America's first hot sauce billionaire. Wow. Wow. Sriracha, he's a billionaire. That's unbelievable. Let's see, the old it's restaurant TV, model baby. is Toast. We asked, you answered, what would you pick for your last meal on death row? It makes me think of Bourdain. I remember you used to ask that question of a lot of people. California's most disadvantaged workers have widespread chronic health issues. New Jersey spaghetti restaurant bans children under 10. <laughs> I told that one to my to my boys. And they want to go. <laughs> yeah, Six year olds. They're like, fight the power. All right. The spectacular rise and fall of fake meat in America. And lastly, why becoming a regular pays off. Which of those do we want to kick off with? Our at-large bid for today. What do you guys spaghetti think? guy. Spaghetti guy. <laughs> the Kids New Kids. Jersey Spaghetti Restaurant. All right. So this is from, from foxbusiness.com. And I got a little quote for them is what I pulled from, from this one. We love kids. We really, truly do. Totally. <laughs> Nettie's totally. House of Spaghetti in Tinton Falls, New Jersey had to say. They quoted, I think, a lot of things you'd expect. It's it's messy. Kids are running around and dangerous as you're carrying things around. Uh, I don't know. They're loud. I think noise was was a thing. So let's let's get into this. As all three of us being fathers, I'm sure we have opinions on this. Banning kids at restaurants. Who wants to pick this one up? Get it. Me? Yo. Yeah. <laughs> So usually uh, you guys are fighting over that. The, the first. So I, I, I mean, we have an interesting perspective. We opened up a sports bar. We turned a breakfast concept into a sports bar and we started hosting fight nights. And the only time that we did not allow children into our establishment was on a big fight night. So whether it was boxing or UFC, it was 21 and up. And we did that for a reason. Those didn't happen until 7 p.m. Um, at night is when we started charging entry fees, so cover for people to come in. But we did that strategically to create a safer environment so that, you know, number one, there weren't kids that were running around. It was later at night and we were a bar. Um, however, 
one of our founding principles as a restaurant was to make sure that all families felt welcome, um, whether any game was on. So, you know, on NFL Sunday, we wanted to make sure grandparents and little kids felt welcome in a sports bar environment. And I know that doesn't seem crazy in 2023, but back in 2008, when you associated sports bars, it was with places that you wouldn't bring families. You wouldn't bring your wife, you wouldn't bring your girlfriend, and you certainly wouldn't bring kids. Why do you think that was? Uh, what it makes me think of right away when you said that was the Coors Light Girl commercials. Like mm -hmm. so much of sports commercials, especially, were so over sexualized. Oh, yeah. Over sexualized. Yep. Like to, to just ridiculous degrees. I, I remember that a lot. So that probably well, I mean, if you think about how much the landscape of in home entertainment, flat screens, the ability to watch NFL, you know, red zone, any of these things that have changed over the last 15 years specifically, there's not a big need to figure out these out of market games. You know, yeah. out of market games, right. satellites, figuring out, hey, I care about, you know, Manchester United. I can only watch it if I'm streaming it on the Internet. All of those things have changed dramatically. So it's much easier for a super fan like myself. We built a place for other super fans. We catered to all 32 NFL teams, Fight Night, UFC. But back to the question of what is a Jersey restaurant? Every restaurant can make their own concept. You know, what we choose to do, if you are a fine dining restaurant and you have dress code attire, you know, unfortunately, I can't go into a fine dining restaurant with a hat on. You know, that's ultimately like, are they discriminating against me? No, that's just literally that's their concept. That's their thing. You know, if the spaghetti place doesn't want to have kids in their restaurant, you know, that is their choice as a business to choose to not to have kids. Um, do I think that that's a bad choice? I don't know. I mean, obviously we're talking about it, so they're getting they're getting a lot of attention on their business. Um, but what is that into the future? You know, I don't know what their business model is. Yeah. Uh, me, I try to be in the hospitality mindset where we take care of everyone and if you can't take care of kids. Then uh, chances are you probably can't take care of adults either. Oh, <laughs> oh. oh, what's the name of this place? Go. What's the name of this restaurant? Nettie's. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, look, I think Nettie's <laughs> House of Spaghetti. Nettie's yeah, House exactly. of Spaghetti. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was thinking. Nettie's Spaghetti. Like, that's exactly where my head went. I, I mean. I instantly want to make fun of this place just because of the name of it. It's like it feels like it should be Chachki anyway. So why wouldn't kids fit into that motif? I don't know. Nettie's. It seems weird to ban at a spaghetti concept. Like, exactly. We're not talking about what like 10 a years old. <laughs> like, what like, are what, we talking about? What does 10 years old mean? You're, you're, yeah. Why is yeah, that the cutoff? Years, yeah, that's a good, know. good point. That's a weird number. I mean, I mean, dude, what are you, I, what are you bringing in a birth certificate? My kid's 11. <laughs> exactly right. My kid's nine. Yeah. Like you have to 11. be, you have to be less than this tall to ride yeah. the Nettie's house of spaghetti ride. Dude, I, two things crossed my mind. One is I, I like what Sean said. I would like the best restaurant sign I ever saw, like all those kitschy restaurant signs that exist. Mm -hmm. The best one I ever saw was remember you came in here. So they can make the rules like you walk, you voluntarily walked in here and if they don't allow 10 year olds and they don't allow 10 year olds. I just don't understand. Like when my, when we had the, uh, when we had Pulpatina, it was like, we, people were like, do you have a kid's menu? I'm like, the whole place is pasta and pizza. Like, well, it's all a kid's menu. Everything is a kid's menu. Right. So they're, they're asking for kids portions and prices is what yeah. they're really asking. Yeah. So we were like, yeah, you want a half portion of, of spaghetti? Yeah. It's nine bucks. I'll sell that all day long. I'll, I can put a line of 10 year olds around the block. That's what they want. And it, that was the reason parents came in because the kids love the spaghetti. And then the parents are having, you know, a bottle of wine. They're having an appetizer. They're having dessert. To me, that was like, I mean, it's the old McDonald's model, the Happy Meal. You know, they make a mess, clean it up. That's your job. I don't know. I just, I don't know. It seems silly to me because the kids, the kids drive a lot of dining decisions. I mean, that's for, for certain concepts. And I think all of I the know. dining decisions, <laughs> like, are driven by kids for for us today so yeah. th this was interesting because I, tr I tried to take a look at all perspectives for me i think it's ridiculous at its face right like you shoot your spaghetti place right you're not per se yeah like, let's, let's get over ourselves for a second and and recognize that your restaurant so from that perspective now as restaurant food people betsy and i take the kids out and we definitely do see other families. I'm like, why are you being a shitty guest right now, family X? 
Like, why are you making that mess? Clean up after yourself. Like, why are you one-timing those servers to death? I, I just, we see it and, it and it makes us uncomfortable quite often because we're grouped in with them. And I think in the article, they said something about that where they're sorry for the families with well-behaved kids. I don't know if we have well-behaved well, you also kids. You opened up a restaurant, not a daycare. And the way that <laughs> some of the people, parents especially, are yeah. coming into, and if you sell alcohol, even worse, because the parents are there and they're like, all of a sudden, hey, the restaurant's not responsible for taking care of your kid that's out on the street. Like, would you mind getting up from your cocktail and going out to the street and taking care of your child in the oncoming traffic, please? See, that, that I've had experience with right. kids that are pretty horrific, standing on tables, crawling on their belly on the floor. Yeah. Like, I don't know. You know, it is what it is. But I'm looking at their website. I mean, I love their branding. It looks awesome. But it says they're not open Valentine's Day and they're closed all next week for winter break. Winter mm -hmm. break? Yeah, exactly. What are they, what? middle school? That sounds like, it sounds like a daycare. Yeah. <laughs> you know? My they... kids up for daycare, too. Yeah, so, you know, yeah. maybe. Who, who knows? Maybe they're really smart. <laughs> They have a, a, a national show like Restaurant Idea Factory talking about them from foxbusiness.com. They might have a line out the door right now of people e. saying, Barnum. yeah, yeah. So yeah, it, it, my, it does go to my head. Like my like my core customer real estate mind is like if your core customers, you know, 65 and older, you know, empty nesters, they're probably ecstatic that there are no kids in that place. Yeah. So who knows? I don't, know if, I don't know if it's a long-term play. I don't know if it's a smart long-term play, but maybe it's a land grab. Maybe it has some effect that way. All right. Netties, that's all the time. That's all the airtime that you get for banning. That means that means that Sean and I can't, can't go to Netties wow. House of Spaghetti in Tinton Falls, New Jersey. I'm looking. I have to go down that way today. I'm going to see if I'm going to drive past it. I was just about to say. The, so there's so many things happening that I'm like, oh, well, we should ask Kyle because he's probably been to this place. You know? <laughs> oh, All right. Let's get into this first segment with our guy, Avi, reading reviews presented by Marquee. Marquee is a one-stop digital operations platform for no-touch digital menu and listing updates. Uh, they are crushing it right now as so much of what we're talking about is like you need to have a stronger digital presence. So Marquee is, we picked the right partner in them. They're becoming hyper, hyper relevant. And I didn't even realize that, I mean, this didn't exist when we had restaurants, Kyle. Like, <laughs> what's going God. on here? So, all right, let's hear what Avi has to say. Hey, Riff team. Let's talk about saving time when responding to reviews. We keep talking about how it's so important to engage with your customers, respond to their reviews, take action on their feedback and encouraging them to keep coming back. Instead of reading you a review today, I wanted to read you a response. This restaurant gave the same response to all of their reviews in one month, dozens of reviews, regardless of star rating, review content, or other context. Thank you for your review, exclamation mark. Please come back and see us again soon. I'm all for automating processes and saving time. Our key was founded on that concept. But what does a restaurant give up, if anything, by using automated responses like this, or even a tool like ChatGPT? Can guests spot the bot? Um, love to hear your thoughts. Is this a checklist item, or is there an opportunity to add a hint of customization? Uh, again, eager to hear your thoughts. Mm. Automation, coming up so much. We wanna automate so many processes. Does it take hospitality out? Does it streamline hospitality? What do you guys think? I'll, I think I'll, that's weak. I'll, that is I'm weak. <laughs> weak. Go. One, go one word. Kyle. Kyle, you go. Why is it I'm, weak? It's not just, I mean, how many, I mean, if you're going to take the time to copy and paste, <laughs> just that act alone shows me you don't give a shit. You don't genuinely respond to anybody. And it just shows it. I don't know. It shows like they, they don't care, right? Like they don't care. Here, I acknowledge it. It was a place around here that did that. It used to say like, hey, you know, sorry, didn't work out. That's not what we intended. You know, reach out to us. You know, we'll set you up with a table or something next time. But I don't know. It just shows that it's not genuine. It's not a genuine thoughtful response. There's probably a way to automate it with all this stuff that seemingly has come online the last month. But I, you know, chat GPT and AI stuff that can be customized. But that copy and paste stuff is bullshit. Thanks, Sean. 
I'm very interested in what ChatGPT does for reviews response specifically because that cuts to the heart of digital hospitality. Absolutely. It's the reason why I responded to 1,500 Yelp reviews as a business owner when we first started, and I mm. had trouble passing that off to a marketing manager because I was worried about the customization, the personalization of every single response, whether it was good or bad, um, to figure out where is that artificial intelligence? Does it understand the tone? So is it pulling data from something that I've responded to those 1500 reviews? Now it has a good data set to understand what do we want to respond into the yeah. future? And you can train them to have yeah. your voice. Correct. If, if it doesn't have a subset of my voice, now I'm worried. Right. You know, so like as a restaurant owner or business owner that's going to be using those tools, like just pulling from some other random barbecue restaurant to think that that has our brand voice, I don't think that that's going to work. I think there's going to be some sort of homework and due diligence that we have to do on the front end for the chat GPT to be successful into the future. Otherwise, you're just going to know it's bullshit. It won't be genuine. You know, yeah. how do you how do you spot the bot? You know, another great point is like. <laughs> Well, how fast do you respond to the review? That's literally what you know, I was like. Literally, it's how fast do you respond to the review? Is it, it does it take five minutes? Because I'm okay with five minutes. But if it does it immediately, like someone posts a review and then all of a sudden Steven responds, like, no, it's gotta be, there's gotta be a buffer in there. Like I don't want them responding 24 hours later. I don't want it 17 hours later, but 15 minutes. What were you and what are you currently? What's your respond rate time? Less, less, less than an hour. And typically it's within 15 minutes. Okay, so that Dang. so that's good. The only way I thought that automation might make sense to an degree is if you have some type of autoresponder. You see this on like Facebook Messenger when people reach out, yep. like a brand on there that says, "We got your, we got you, and we'll get back to you." And it's something that I believe in. Rapid response is something that's basically a core value within what we do at Best Serve. And I will respond to people so quickly. Usually it's that less than an hour, less than three hours. If it takes 24 hours, I'm in a hospital bed somewhere, right? <laughs> Half the time I might respond with, I can't respond right now. Like, I'll just be like, you know, I, I, I see you. I hear you. I got you later. Yeah. Because we're in the relationship business. Talk about that a lot. And if you don't respond to me for 10 days, 12 days, 14 days, you're fucking dead to me. We're over. This relationship is done. And I was so busy. I just, this and that. We're all busy. None of us have any time. <laughs> That's the world yeah. that we live in. Uh, you can definitely find a way to just throw somebody a line and say, hey, you, you matter enough. I'm just in the weeds at this well, I mean, moment. It, I it, it comes back to what we, what we talk about with digital hospitality. When someone walks into your restaurant, do they matter? Do they if they matter? don't matter then okay then ignore them for 15 hours or 24 hours but if they matter and you say hello and you smile right when you op right when you open the door now how do you do that online well you do it online with tools like marquee you know like that's why we care about and we partner with the people that we are rocking with. their hats I, I mean it's no but it's no joke it's no joke yeah. because it's hard to do across all of these different platforms when you have so many different people reaching out to you on facebook on Google on Yelp, how do you customize that response so that people know that you care? Because we care well, in real this. life. What if, what if it, you were able to build it in where it was somehow, here we go, keyed in with seven shifts, that it was able to read your schedule. You have somebody in your schedule assigned to be the person who's responding to those. There is a within 10 minutes re response that is automated that can pull the name of that person from the schedule that says, Kyle will be getting back to you shortly. And then an hour and a half from that moment, because it's in the middle of service, whatever it might be, Kyle, in fact, does get back to that person. Then all of a sudden you've created this like, oh, wow, Kyle's getting back. And then Kyle actually got back to me. Like, So you could think about it in a way that creates that digital hospitality in that interaction and allows you to do that quickly and have rapid response. So there might be a way that you can think about it that way, but the, just the canned stuff, canned questions exactly. get canned answers, canned responses get canned feedback from your guests. And so you ask, how is everything? Everything is fine. Neither of those things was, was real, right? Yeah. So yeah, that's the Danny Meyer thing. Like, you're, you're not responsible for everything. How's everything? Uh, the fish is good. Um, my job sucks. Or, you know, like my car's broken down. <laughs> Everything is not okay. 
just so you know, Mr. So and so. But like, yeah, I to me though, that is you know an opportunity, and it's the same thing. And I talk about like I talk about all the time the fact that somebody feels like they can just it's the match, it's the same thing as being in person. If I just if you were asking me questions and I kept I gave you guys both the exact word for word same answer, you'd be like, This guy's a fucking asshole. <laughs> just fucking repeating it, you know what I mean? It's not genuine. I think it's it, I could see it with my daughter every day. Those digital communications are just as impactful as as actual communications one on one. Maybe more. Yeah. Yeah, maybe more. They are the gatekeeper now for in person communication. Like IRL only happens if you have a solid digital relationship. If I like your text game, I mean, fuck, you, you can make fun of them, but you'll have you'll have the game. Uh, He's a 10, but his text bubbles are green. And they go, it's a zero. You're like, what the fuck does that mean? That means they don't have an iPhone. <laughs> like, yeah. and is it, does that matter? I don't know. Is it the reality of some of the way that we interact? It is. So like, we need to understand and have just I mean, an I, understanding. I interviewed this incredible 21 year old for our show back in the day. And he told me, this was like two years ago. And he told me that he only does brand deals with principles when right when he meets somebody that's anybody that's an entrepreneur millionaire billionaire the only the first thing he does is he goes to their instagram page have you yeah, produced any content are you active and if you're not you're dead to him the deal's done it doesn't matter how big the brand is the deal's done oh yeah and that was you know three years ago yeah i don't disagree with that at all i mean now when we look at same thing we're vetting potential clients we look at their instagram page before we look at their website even yep you know, because that's their ongoing it's your digital dialogue. heartbeat. It's your digital are you heartbeat. good at having a, a, a digital conversation? Your website's, you know, 82% static, right? So that tells me oh, yeah. messaging and branding. Oh, right. Shouldn't be <laughs> 100%. And so that, that's interesting to me. If you haven't posted in in two months, you're like, who are you talking to? You know? Yeah. All right, we're going to get into this next uh, at-large segment, unionization. This is coming up a lot. We've dropped these articles. We've touched on them a little bit. And Troy Hooper from Kiwi Restaurant Groups, good friend to us, good friend of the show, challenged us, texted the three of us, threw this topic down. Was talking about, you know, a lot of the, the big publications aren't picking this up because corporate money puts food in their mouth, right? And so it is the responsibility of us three idiots to have a conversation about unions. And uh, and he threw us a, a TikTok video. And we cut this down a little bit, but this will get the point across. So let's check out what Troy shared with us. Restaurant workers at Rockefeller Center's Lodi are unionizing. Let's talk about it. Hi, I'm Caro. I'm actually a bartender at Lodi in Manhattan. And on January 25th, my coworkers and I went public with our intention to unionize with Restaurant Workers Union, a democratic independent union in the city who intend on organizing our entire industry. Since we went public, we've been subjected to a vicious anti-union campaign by Mata's Hospitality, which is the restaurant group that owns Lodi, including fear-mongering among our immigrant coworkers, illegal solicitation of grievances, endless captive audience meetings, surveillance, all kinds of stuff. So I'm about to play some clips of some of my immigrant coworkers talking about their reaction to this campaign. You're going to hear Luis and Osvaldo and JC talk. But before I do, stay updated, show your support. Our Instagram and Twitter are right here. If you want to write us a solidarity letter, you can email it to us. We could use all the help we could get right now. By the way, this is our boss, Ignacio Matos. He's a celebrity chef in New York City. He owns multiple famous restaurants. Just keep that in mind. When I came to Lodi, I came very because it's a place with prestigio. Pensé que iba a tener más apoyo. Pensé que al ser latino y dueño íbamos a tener. All right. Playing on repeat there. <laughs> so want to get a little of that. I know uh, we definitely do have some uh, Spanish speaking in the audience. That the, basically the rest of that video is about three minutes. Was uh, was a lot of the uh, Hispanic community within that restaurant talking about their experience and expectations and shortcomings all of those type of things so kyle i know this is uh like you said kind of big news up uh up in your area so so get into this what, what are your thoughts here on on this specific situation maybe you can address that and then we can talk about unionization at large i mean i know that it's i mean in new york it's was always very desirable to try to get 
those union jobs, like in the hotels and things like that, because it was, you know, I came out of culinary school, a line cook, if you could get $12 an hour as a line cook, you were crushing it. But the, the guy over the height was making $25 an hour with benefits. Mm -hmm. Um, but you had to sacrifice the creative piece, right? Like you can't be as creative. You're going to be making Western omelets, turkey clubs, and doing a clam chowder versus going to work some other place where you can flex your muscles a little bit. And I don't know, man. I, it's, it's, it's one of those things similar to like the landlord tenant stuff. Like you, you got to find some happiness in the middle. The, the initial response is always like, this is what we want. You better listen. And the other side is like, F you doesn't work for us. But the answer is always somewhere in the middle. And I think at this point, I, you have to have the conversation. I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's something that either side is 100% right on. There's probably some way to make it work for both. But anything that's going to make a positive step, you know, particularly like right now for restaurants, I think this is this is something that we, we should really be taking a hard look at. And what about this restaurant specifically? What's what's the word on them historically? Bad no, they're relatively or... new. They're Whatever. relatively new. Super you know, super dope location. That Rockefeller Center area is like on fire. It was for just sure. considered like for years, it was just kind of like a mall below the ice skating rink. Mm -hmm. But now they got a lot of restaurants in there in that area. You know, Fifth Avenue is right there. You have some of the most expensive real estate and biggest retailers, you know, high end luxury retailers on the planet that are right there. So for this to all be going down right there is it's pretty high profile. You know, it's not some restaurant tucked away in the Lower East Side that people are hearing about. You know, it's got a lot of employees. It's big. It's packed. Um, it literally sits adjacent to where the tree is. So it's right, right yeah. there. Um, so I think the location and, and, and its success is what's kind of bringing a lot of attention to it. Understood. John, what, what are your thoughts? You know, it's, it's tough to hear somebody that's asking for help. And I think that's one of the, the biggest problems with anything that's happening is that before these voices were suppressed, but now because of social media, people can share stories and people can be called to action. You know, that's ultimately what's happening is people have been put into positions where they're not happy. They felt like they're getting taken advantage of. And because so, now they have platforms like TikTok and YouTube and Instagram and podcasts to get their voices to a bigger audience. And that bigger audience are either compelled to act or they're compelled to act against them. You know, that's the unfortunate part. And how, where does it all, you know, where do I stand on unions? I, I, I stand on the hospitality industry and I can't build a barbecue restaurant without the people that I employ. And do I want to create a better culture and a better work environment for them? Absolutely, I do. I've spent the last 15 years, day and night, trying to figure out how to build a more profitable restaurant so that I can take care of the people that take care of my village. If I could do that, I would have done that. Can I do that into the future? I believe I can. I believe the things that we're doing will build a better future. Having tools like Seven Shifts to have the pulse of my team so they, I start to understand, right. hey, I've got a bunch of bartenders that are not happy with their wages. They're not happy with their schedule. They're not happy with their manager. How can I address that before that becomes a bigger issue across multiple restaurants that I own or multiple restaurant groups? Like, that's the problem here. You know, the problem is that people's voices have been ignored and they haven't felt like they've been listened to. How do we get bad reviews? I mean, when, we, when a customer has a bad review, if lots of customers in our place and we're the only place in all of Spring Valley for them to eat and they're all upset, now all of a sudden it becomes a bigger problem. How do you address the bigger problem is you've got to have those difficult conversations that obviously this restaurant group hasn't had or they haven't gone the way that they wanted them to go. This was a challenging and will continue to be a challenging topic for me. And I'll just kind of preface this with, I've never worked in a union job and I haven't really had deep, long conversations with people that have at the worker level or at the manager level. So I appreciate Troy and this show, honestly, guys, like there's a lot of topics that I've had to go deep dive into that I was severely undereducated in, in an industry that, you know, we're supposed to know something about. So I'm grateful for that. I'm, I'm grateful to, to be forced to ask the questions. This was interesting from a, from a kind of meta standpoint for me as well. I'm such a futurist. But what that means to me is that I'm obsessed with the future. And I'm actually very fascinated with the past and history. And I struggle with being in the here and now. So I actually know more about unions in this country and the history of it all the way back to 1768 than I do what's happening today. 
So Troy shared a couple of the resources and I went deep diving into a lot of what's happening today and I still don't understand it well enough. So I'm gonna comment by saying, I will always believe in and support the organization of workers and the advocacy for workers. And that's hard for me as somebody who's such a entrepreneurial hustler that I always want to put the business first at my own detriment quite often. And that means in my own past that I put my coworkers, those that worked with me and for me at a detriment because of that single-minded goal of the future and forgot about the here and now. So what's interesting though, is right now today, what I read is 68% of Americans support unionization. This is the highest since the 1960s. In the 40s, 50s, and the 60s, we were in unions, were really big here. And part of that was also problematic because, you know, I say Teamsters and instantly a lot of people think of Jimmy Hoffa and the, mo the mob and, and how corrupt all of that was. And there's truth to that for sure. The business model of a union has a lot of fallacies to it, as many as the business model of a restaurant does, right? And I think what's important for us to understand, too, is the context that we live in. We're like one of the lowest percentage of labor not, labor labor unionized workers in the world, I think we're at like 10% of our workforce is in a union. 3% of restaurants are unionized. So even restaurants are a much, much lower number. I think there's a lot of factors that the fact that they're high turnover rate, it's hard to organize a group of people when that group of people is constantly changing. It's transient. I think that's, that's problematic. But what we saw in 2022 and in 2023 is I think it was like 250 Starbucks branches unionized. That's a pre pretty big number. We also saw Chipotle, Pete's Coffee, uh, McDonald's and Taco Bell. I think they had some collective action happen as well. Trader Joe's. There's a few other big brands, a lot of it in the uh, Northeast. Right? There was also a number of, I think, seven states make up half of the union workers. And it was Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania. Right. So I think it's also something that's so in our DNA because it started in the Industrial Revolution. Anyway, I could go on and on about this. We're going to talk about it a lot more. But uh, just for everyone to know, I'm trying to learn more about what's happening today so that I can support and challenge any of what's happening in this space. I will support the organization of workers always. I'm not always going to support the actions therein of the unions and the way that those are deployed. So that's that's a challenge as well, because believing in one and challenging the other, sometimes it's so black and white to Kyle's point of you have to be on this side of the fence or that side of the fence. But a lot of time, even just the threat and challenge and recognition that people are organizing, people hop to and a lot of times they say, oh, wait a minute. OK, maybe we, we were wrong. And every time in our history that we've seen spikes in unionization, we had bad fucking practices straight up. They were they were bad practices and these aren't like lazy and entitled people is another thing that's important i think that gets thrown around a lot when you look at the history of our country the people that have have unionized and gotten into collective bargaining are like mill workers railroad workers like steel factory manufacturing workers like shoemakers <laughs> these are some of the hardest working people they're not lazy and entitled if you want to throw that around because you see kids these days at the forefront holding picket signs fine but the reality of that history in our in our culture and our in our country is pretty rooted in really fucking hard workers like miners so i don't know that's that's my take on it all right anything else on that this is like no, yeah, i bet this is like a heavy perspective. You that's a that, historical perspective, man. I don't have that's that. That's where I that's where I go. I, I could even rip off like five, six, eight acts throughout history that have had an impact on it. But I don't know what's happening today. This is this is a problem with me being thinking, you know, future and past, and I forget about the here and now. And people are living in the here and now. And they're they're struggling. They're crying out for help, like Sean said. Like they're not able to pay their fucking bills. We have to figure oh. that out. We have to fix that part of the problem. And you can point at why should McDonald's workers get paid $15 an hour because cops only get paid $22 an hour. Well, cops should get paid a lot more than that. Why are we pitting those two groups against yeah. each other? Makes no sense to me, but it's good for political fodder. So, all right, what are we getting into next? We are, oh, this, <laughs> we're staying heavy. 
seven ship. We're gonna talk. We're we're staying heavy this whole episode, guys. Uh, Damn. I'm gonna, I'm gonna need to, yeah, I was gonna say I'm gonna need a Is that vodka, Jim. This. Are you chugging vodka, homie? No, oh, come. I'm too old for that. At least right, at least go. make it aviation gin if you're gonna do anything. Let's, get, let's go get some Ryan Reynolds gin. Let's go get Ryan Reynolds. No, oh, God, like no. Never reach out to Ryan Reynolds. No. Emphasizing teams presented by seven shifts. I am pumped for this one. I want to give you guys a little context. Everybody watching, listening to this. We're going to hear from Maylee Jacob. Jordan hey, Bush, hey. CEO, is our, our correspondent for this segment. We've learned a lot. He's challenged us. We've had some great segments there. Maylee stepped in. Maylee's been the one behind the scenes making this all happen on the Seven Shifts team. Love that you're wearing the sweatshirt right now. I wish I, I had one. Unsung Hospitality Hero. Shout out, Maylee. Like, you got, you got to get good at unboxing to get swag. <laughs> We're counting on you. You got to get uh, good at unboxing. Come on. It was it was really, really great to see this. I also love that Maylee is not somebody who gets on camera a lot. She said that to me. And put something out that was, you know, it was... Like anybody who's doing their first video, it was awkward, uncomfortable, and it didn't say a lot. And I got on the phone with Maylee and said, hey, there was one moment in what you said that I was so interested in. Can you and are you willing to go there? And Maylee was willing to go there and tell a deeper part of her story. I am unbelievably grateful for anybody that will ever allow us, us three, to bring out and amplify some of their story. So I just... This is so meaningful to me and to us. So thank you, Maylee. And thank you to anybody who's willing to get on their smartphone, get on social media and tell their story. That shit, if it matters, straight up, it matters. So let's hear from Maylee Jacob over at Seven Shifts. Maybe I should put So on. I'm an ex server. When I was in school, I got a job at a trendy chain restaurant that just opened up in the city. And it was my first true restaurant job. At that point in my life, the vibe delivered on exactly what I wanted. It was fun. We partied. I made cash tips. I don't think tip pulling was a thing back then. But it was also really high stress. And it was a very sexualized environment. And it wasn't always filled with respect and teamwork. It was a really great stopping point for me, but I never saw it as my full career. You know, it was a jumping point before my real career. Looking back now, and with the work that I'm doing for Seven Shifts, but also shows like The Bear, we've all seen The Bear, you know, it just digs into how much things haven't changed, and that sucks. Things that I took as a whatever back then that I would never accept now, these things are still happening. You know, the industry hasn't evolved, at least not on a wider scale. So I think about the people now, ones taking that server job, working as a line cook, working as a bartender, the ones really passionate about the industry. And I think, how are we supporting them? How are we creating this great restaurant workspace that hasn't gotten the prioritization it deserves? Me. Me. For, right? I, I want to... Friday, maybe. Maybe he's bringing the heat on a Friday. That's dude. <laughs> We'll do some like outtakes or blooper stuff and show different, you know, versions of videos that like we end up making that we think are nice and crispy and ready to ready to go. It, it was a transformation too. And I was watching this the first time, like absolute goosebumps. Like I was I, I had chills because I was feeling and knowing and understanding exactly where she's at. I'm gonna jump in on this one. Mainly there was two things that I would say, two reasons out of the thousands that I believe have a major impact on the reasons that restaurants have not changed to the degree that you would want them to change. Number one is an adolescent mindset. Nobody becomes an investment banker, a lawyer, a doctor at 14, 15, 16, 17. So many of us get into this industry at that age. Sean was 13. I was 17. And we find our people. There's a sense of belonging and purpose that you find when you find a restaurant. And we hold on to that so tightly that we stay in this 17 year old mindset until we can't do it anymore, right? We hold on to that. And so there's a challenge there that I'm always trying to understand for myself personally, especially. To give you some context to understand what that means for our industry at large, a third of our industry is under 21 years old, another third 
is 30 or less. That is a very, very young industry. And unfortunately, we don't get out of that mindset quite often. We aren't given the tools, the resource, the support, the leadership, the training to be able to get out of that mindset. That's one of the reasons. And we hold on to it pretty desperately. We want to keep being that cool kid who's out partying and I still got it. I'm still the hot shit chef. That was for me. Number two is the business model. The industry standards haven't changed enough. We have copied and pasted the same P&Ls for the last 30 years and expected these numbers of occupancy percentage and labor percentage and poor cost and food cost and manager payroll. They've been fixed. And the reality is that business model doesn't work. Those are the two reasons that I would say restaurants have not changed and are in such turmoil and disruption right now. What do you guys think? That felt kind of preachy, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your your homework for us was to be less preachy. <laughs> uh, I was I'll, 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 bring I'll bring you guys. I'll I'll bring you guys the audience behind the curtain. But but Jensen came in and told me and Kyle said, "Hey guys, be less preachy." <laughs> no, no, no. I <laughs> said that. Work on the mic drop. I said that I'm super <laughs> preachy. Tell them. I was hoping one of you guys would cut me off. I felt like I was giving a sermon right there. So yeah, I, I felt like I was listening mean. to one. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take I'll take it I'll take it from here and, and May Lee thank you for your honesty your vulnerability it's why we created this show is to have difficult conversations that other people were unwilling to have and I can just tell you from personal experience back to our opening up a sports bar in 2008 um, when we first hired we thought that we needed to have female servers um, and that was a misconception and a big miss on our part because of what we grew up with. We grew up with Hooters and we grew up with brands like this that um, had places where if men were coming to watch football, they were expecting to have female servers. Um, I remember having a difficult conversation with my business partner, Corey, and just saying, is this the right way for us to build our business? Um, that conversation led to us changing our entire outlook and hiring male servers and changing our uniform policy, um, making it so people were comfortable in their clothes, not sexualized in their clothes mm -hmm. and them being comfortable in their clothes and having male servers and having old servers and having young servers. Um, no longer did it matter what they looked like or what their experience was. It was their heart. It was who they were as people and how were they able to take care of our guests. And what we found was the more that we looked for heart in their DNA, the better our business got. And that was very difficult for us to do, um, especially where we're located, hosting fight nights and hosting NFL Sunday ticket. We were questioned on a lot of different turns, but it turned out for the better. Um, we created a better environment. Does that mean we have the perfect environment? No. Um, we have young people that work for us now, you know, young people that don't know the history of the restaurant. And it's my job or my leader's job to have conversations like this, to let people know um, that if they feel uncomfortable, we need to know about it. You know, and that that's the difficult part. You know, that that's to be honest with you, that's the the most difficult part is that we expect them to be proactive when our job as leaders is to create that environment so that they do feel, what if they don't feel safe to say something? What if they don't yeah. feel safe to, to come? You know, the, the, the worst thing is, uh, oh, we have an open door policy. Fuck your open door policy. I don't feel safe coming into your open door to, your, to even say anything. Yeah. So that's a problem. That's back to what Jordan said last week with, uh, with those feedback loops. Yeah, Kyle, what, what's your thoughts here? Maley, shout out to Maley again. Yeah, hell yeah. Shout out to Maley for, for sharing that because it's, you know, it's at that time or at any time. But I mean, to put somebody in that position, to me, everything starts at the top. So if you're allowing that to happen as an owner, as a manager, then you're 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 perpetuating this belief that that's OK. And I think you have a responsibility, your responsibility to the other people who work there, to, to everyone as humans, to, to treat them as such. To me, it's who's the best person. Who is the best person for this job? Who is the best, you know, uh, best hospitality, best server, best cook, best overall, you know, fit for our brand? And um, it's unfortunate that it, had, it took things like, you know, the pandemic or unfortunate incidents that happened to bring this stuff to light. But for, for way too long, this industry has been plagued with stuff like that. And, you know, oftentimes nobody says a word, right? Yeah. 
And that's that's what happens. I remember my, my first situation. It was in, completely insane. Things I wouldn't even say on this podcast, which for me to say that is, is something. What happened <laughs> at this restaurant when I was 15 right. years old, I was like, this is not okay. How does yeah. this happen? It doesn't happen at the insurance office. It doesn't happen at, at schools, at colleges, at you know, at, at that's what I was making. You said you're 15. A 15 year old doesn't have the capacity, the experience to to say something, and we stay in that mindset. So we're 25, 28 years old, and we're still in that place. We're like, well, I don't know if I should say something. Right. And that's that's a major major problem. Yeah, the, right. the impact you're having on those people it could last forever. You know what I mean? It like, it's, they think that yeah. it's okay. That's a, that's a the young staff and and, and the older staff, anybody there. You're you're putting them in a position where they're there to make a, a living. They're not there to, to, to be abused. They're not there to, you know, they're part of this family, this team that you're building. It's, it's uh, completely outrageous and things that we would never ever, you know, in yeah. our restaurant, if we ever saw that was immediate, you know, you got, you got to nip that right in the bud wider, right? Otherwise it keeps, uh, keeps going on. All right. Mayley. Well, this was a very preachy segment, right? <laughs> right here. guys. I think it's important though. Maylee, thank you so much for, uh, we're challenging us this way. We need we need to do better as leaders. There's zero doubt about it. All right, come on, Zach. Can we count? Zach, can he lighten it up for us <laughs> Let's a little go, bit? Zach. Come yeah, on, where, where's Zach. my ovation gear? By the way, here we go. We're gonna uh, talk see? guest experience presented by Ovation. Zach Oates is gonna hopefully get us up. Zach. up. And uh, Ovation is a two question survey platform for real time feedback, better online reviews and happier guests let's get some of that happiness going yeah. here and listen Please. to what zach has to say <laughs> are you ready to talk about the big bad wolf of third-party delivery look when it comes to third-party delivery here's what we found when it comes to the guest experience is yeah there's going to be more issues there but how do you take control of it how do you take those guests from ordering and being a fan of a third-party delivery to ordering and being a fan directly from you. We've seen a lot of things like bag stuffers where you put in a, hey, order from us next time here. The problem is they just got your food. They're not ready to order. Or it'll be, hey, enter our email list. Well, guess what? A lot of people don't want to get more emails. The thing that we have found that has worked most successfully, even in asking for customer data, is asking how their experience was. People are willing to give their feedback. People are willing to say, hey, I had a good experience. I had a bad experience. But when you make it so, so simple of two questions, when you make it really easy for them, that is how you not only get the feedback, but you get the data to convert them to first party and get their email and phone number to order directly from you next time. So my question is, what are you doing to convert your third party guests to first party. Yeah, Zach. The I know. Yeah, Zach, thank you, bro. <laughs> uh, he's always got such uh, such great energy. He's wearing the jacket, but he's still got a, a dope shirt on. You can always count on, on his shirts. So here's what's uh, interesting on this front, guys, is I like, actually, here's what I want to say first. I love that he went for the ovation is the solution. Right, like that's good. Don't steal my plug, thunder. Plug, jab, plug. jab, 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 right hook. I like, I like that. There's a right hook. We're on episode number eight. It's, a, it's about time. So that two question platform changes the relationship into a text relationship, which we talked about, especially for the youth and the future uh, decision makers. It matters. All right, Sean, what do you think? Well, I mean, it, it, the beautiful thing about the partners that we have on the show is that we believe not only believe but use the products that are on the show so I, I mean i am an ovation customer at cali barbecue anytime i talk tech stack i'm always celebrating ovation and that's because texting is the most personal communication that you can have with a guest yeah, i mean great. think about the people that have your cell phone number you know we have so many brands that have our emails or we have brands that we follow on facebook or instagram how many people have your cell phone number and literally how many people market to you in a way that you actually want those ads because they give you a text out, you know, like opt out. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you've got to be somebody very important or we care about you enough to get into yeah. my cell phone, to get into my wife's cell phone and to get there by text. 
And what I text Zach, stop a lot. I'll just put it that way. Yeah, right? correct. Yeah, I mean, what's even worse is when politicians get, you know, uh, your, your, and it's it's political season, and all of a sudden you're getting bombarded with vote for this or vote for that. Get health insurance stuff left and right. Let me tell you, or ER, uh, uh, earn, earned income tax credit. Yeah, I get those too. <laughs> yeah. But nonetheless, it's how do you make the relationship back to somebody ordering on DoorDash or ordering on Uber Eats, or ordering on Grubhub? How do you personalize that relationship? You personalize it by asking a question, you know, by asking a question, how was your experience? And you get entered into an opportunity to win a hundred dollar gift card, which is what we do at our restaurant. Now we have a personal communication. If some, like the amount of times that we've saved a customer, from going from getting an Uber Eats order that somehow we forgot barbecue sauce or we didn't include a jalapeno cheddar cornbread. And because of the QR code that we add in the stuffer, instead of them going to Uber Eats and asking for a credit or saying, you know, something was wrong with their order, they text us. They text my manager on duty with mm -hmm. Ovation platform so that our manager on duty can go, we're very sorry that we forgot that. We'll be better next time. Here's a gift card for a free basket of jalapeno cheddar cornbread. Boom. Yeah, you solved that problem Game instantly. Changing. Damn. Instantly. Now I want jalapeno cheddar cornbread. <laughs> Sounds good. Starving. Don't come to Restaurant Idea Factory hungry. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you got to try. That's that's the name of the game, right? Building this community around your restaurant. Getting that information and, and being able to communicate with your guests one-on-one -on -one is, I mean, can you imagine that back in the day? When everyone was putting ads in like the Penny Saver or like the Yellow Pages and like sending out flyers of menus. I don't know where those things are going to find yeah. out who your customers are. You can text them. They can text you back. I was at even, even how about this for first party data? I was at a steakhouse in midtown last night, very high end steakhouse. And the server has it's two levels looking out on fifth Avenue. Beautiful. And he's like, what do you think of the best table in midtown? I'm like, he's not wrong. It's a pretty unbelievable table. Hands me a card. That is like, he's the waiter service for that restaurant. And they've clearly given him this right to do that. And if you need a table, text him. Text him directly if you want a table. He comes in there. He's like, look, what do you guys want? You try it. If you don't like it, I'll send it back. <laughs> oh, dude, it was insane. That's some New he, York shit. Like, I know a guy. I got yeah, a guy. But that's what we were talking about, talking about last night. Like, because New Yorkers are screwed because we're so needy when it comes to the hospitality. But if you don't give it back, you know, if you don't give the respect back to them, like if you don't give him 20 bucks when you leave, I'm sure he gets a lot more than that from a lot of people at that place. You're probably not going to get it. That's very New York way. But the fact that he's like, I'm going to send this out. He's like, order whatever you want here because dessert's on me. He said that's the first thing he said when he got up there. You know, and it, I thought it was next level. And I think owners had that opportunity too. So, I mean, it used to annoy me back in the day. Like we had a, we had a super small restaurant and guests who had my number would be like, hey, can you get us a table? People do it yeah. all. They'd still do yeah. it to me today. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right now, today. But I want them to do yeah, right. it. Right. Yeah. I, I, but I literally encourage people. I'll go on TikTok live and say, send me a message on Instagram and let me know when you come to the restaurant because you saw me on TikTok live. And yeah, then right. they'll come. And they and think you're like, lying and they don't take you up on it. But the ones that do, the ones that do, all of a sudden they're making a up. TikTok video. I oh, mean, yeah. it, it's literally happened. Well, I've had somebody in like Missouri watching a TikTok live. They're like, I'm coming to visit my daughter who lives in San Diego this weekend. They came to San Diego, brought their daughter to our restaurant That's and go, good. oh, my God, like I, I met this guy because of TikTok live. I mean, is that how we're going to get all of our business? No, but it's the personalization, right? Yeah. If you want to scale, do things that don't scale. I, I love <laughs> there you go. I love that quote. I love that approach. That's exactly what you're doing. And that's why you have the DNA to be able to scale. Here's just, I'll just give a really practical thing because I think you guys covered our whole thesis of everything that we believe. And this is why it's important. This is why Zach is like putting this out there for us. I really like the QR code thank you video. I've been talking about something as simple as that so often, especially uh, for the opportunity of win back or for the opportunity to create an owned customer. I think that is incredibly important. And we don't recognize that these third party platforms they own that customer you're you're just borrowing them for that that individual transaction right and so many customers in, don't understand the financial dynamic at play and they think that the restaurants doing gangbusters the reality is a lot of times that percentage fees and all that is a pretty big hit for the restaurant so there's a tumultuous relationship on all sides and i think there's not a lot of transparency the qr code video 
let's say that you have a, a, a chow now on your own site that you're able to order through as I slam my mic and you have Uber Eats, Grubhub and DoorDash that are coming through the third party platforms. And you're able to throw a QR code sticker on the bag, wherever they scan that and it comes and pops up a video. Thank you so much for ordering from us. We couldn't do without you as an independently owned restaurant, a family restaurant. This means the world to us. And just so you know, we have a great ordering platform directly on our website. If you ever are able to come directly to us, it makes a big difference for us financially. And if not, we'll continue to serve you wherever it is that you find us and are ordering from that. How long was that? 18 seconds. That could change the economics of your business completely. They may still be a Grubhub customer, but what if one out of six times they remember to go directly to your website? What out of those six times, another one, they come and pick it up from you because the, the relationship has been deeper, deepened. That could change your business completely because if one, two, 22, 154 people change their behavior to that degree, that's a big, big number. So we really have to think about that. That to me, Zach, is the actionable thing that I would do because it also changes our own behavior of how we're creating a relationship. That video, very simple, directly from chef, directly from whomever, and they get to know that person. So appreciate that. All right. Well, yeah, it was heavy and long. Right. We're, yeah. we're at, I want to get one. Please. Do you anything else we want to tackle, like climate or? I mean, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> what else do we want to talk about? I think we're going to get invited to like a G8 summit soon to change alien, uh, alien balloons. To the world's alien problems balloons. over here. Uh, <laughs> real quick. See, this isn't even not heavy. We're going to end with this just super, super quick because it was just a really interesting timing. As Kyle said, hey, South by Southwest is like coming up already. Do we want to go? And like 2024. And then saw this uh, that uh, we have Ruth Reichel is, let me see. Where we got this somewhere here. Legendary food writer Ruth Reichel's documentary will play at South by Southwest in Austin coming up. Uh, I think it uh, um, premiered at, um, uh, oh, come on. What's the one that Robert Redford does up in the mountains over here? What's that one? Not Khan's Sundance. Sundance. I think it, it might have uh, premiered at Sundance. Anyway, I digress. All right. So, they did a documentary. Let me just touch on this. It was uh, Lauren Gabbard did that, who's done a couple other in the food space. And I guess just my real quick take on it, because I haven't seen it yet. It's basically following a lot of interviews with a lot of farm workers and the food system and understanding what's happening in our food system, which is incredibly challenging system that we have. I like that uh, Rima Seal, Farmer Lee Jones, Alice Water, Karen Washington, some people that I know, some homies were uh, featured in that. So that was really cool to see. And I think it's interesting, this food system thing, we're going to have to talk about a lot more, guys. We're getting hit up by people. Rick Boyd has shared a couple things with us about droughts, about what that means for the farm system. The farm bill is coming up again this year, which is kind of the marquee piece of legislation that uh, you know started history, started in 1933 as part of the New Deal uh, to combat the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl under FDR, right? Uh, <laughs> but but I don't know what's going on with it now. I think you know, title it's it's twelve titles. Title one is pretty problematic because it, it addresses commodities, and there's huge issues there with who gets the subsidies therein, and it's it's a massive land grab to the top where these big big companies are making that money. And I think at one point maybe. Oh, I don't know. The 1930s, we're at like 6.8 million farms in this country, and we're at 2 million now, mm. right? And so it's it's pretty unbelievable what's happened there. Uh, I don't know. That's the things that I'm thinking about with that. I want people to check this out. Let us know about this film. You guys, you guys know anything about it at all? I don't. I don't know yeah. anything about it. Sorry yeah. to say. I just saw South by Southwest and Ruth Reichel. I said sold. <laughs> yeah. Let's she wrote a good article Ruth recently, did. though, too, about, about restaurants, the state of restaurants. So, yeah, she got – I love Ruth. Yeah, she's, she's big time, man. So it's Huge. All right. Well, we'll I think we'll probably end up getting into this a little bit more. Maybe this was just an opportunity to foray. And, uh, and I like that there's some filmmakers talking about it. I think it's pretty important. You know, unions – I think the uh, farmers union that uh, Cesar Chavez and them started hit 60 years old, maybe last year. So it's 
it's pretty monumental what's happening in that space. And they are still some of the most underserved. One of our headlines was, you know, the workers in California are seeing health crisis stuff because of the amount of chemicals and things mm-hmm. in, in these fields that they're working. So anyway, all right, guys. Whew. Man, I need <laughs> to sit down. I'm like, I'm like out of breath. I need now. a drink. That was a serious show. All right, next week, let's have maybe a couple uh, Hollywood segments and a couple of uh, fun stuff. Need some more TikTok videos in there. Can we, yeah. Can some, less heavy, some less heavy TikTok videos. There's a lot of people sharing <laughs> some heavy stuff with us. And I don't know. I, the fact that they trust us to be able to talk about those things, because maybe other people aren't, I think is 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 great for us. But also, hey, <laughs> We're also just some guys who want to talk about some fun parts of the industry. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't mind one where we just talk about New York style versus New Haven style pizza. You know? <laughs> now, now that made me real hungry. That's not fair. That's, that's what we're talking about. All right, everybody, tell us how we can do better next week. Go to restaurantideafactory.com for sure. That's where you can submit a topic or you can submit a headline that you want us to riff on. Clearly, we listen, we pay attention. We do feature things that are put in front of us because that's one of the ways that we learn and understand what's most important to you. Become a rifter as well. You can drop your email there. Follow us at Restaurant Idea Factory and on all the social medias as well. So good show, guys. Amazing. Hell Let's yeah. call it there. Rift 008. Excellent show. And we will see you. Uh, we'll see you next.